Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. And uh, I work in particular in the Directorate for Science, Technology and Industry, which is responsible for innovation, let's say more broadly, and in particular, the digital economy, uh, the internet economy. So um, in 2010, we started a project um, on the economics of personal data, uh, which looks at the, the role of personal data for, uh, as a currency in the internet economy and a source of innovation which um, also led um, to the review of the OECD privacy guidelines, uh, which were uh, released uh, in September this year. And another kind of input to that work on the uh, privacy guideline, which I would like also to inform you about, is um, the, the work on data as a new source of growth, which is basically the reason also why I'm talking here. Uh, which look at the role of data, not only personal data, I have to say, but um, also industrial data, also weather data, environmental data, and so on, um, as a source for productivity growth, um, innovation, and social well-being. So um, the work we are doing here um, looks at how can we use data to, for instance, to increase transparency in the public sector? How can we use data um, as a new source for research and science? And also, how can we use um, data for making healthcare, maybe, uh, for, for example, uh, smarter? And there are a couple of themes that touches um, across all the different, if you want, topics that we are addressing. Uh, one is obviously privacy. Um, this is like the big elephant room in the big data world. And um, it won't go away. And uh, so we are working hard on this topic both again. Um, another one is skills and employment, because we believe that big data raises a lot of issues in terms of skills requirements, which is obviously also very important for developing countries. But it also raises a lot of issues in terms of employment more broadly, because um, many of the big data applications that we are looking at for increasing productivity that can have a negative impact on employment as well, that we need to consider. What I would like to raise now for the last minute, one minute that I have, um, is um, the theme of open data. And um, it's an important theme for us because we believe um, that, and I think it's related to what Robert just told us, um, the idea that open uh, our data is a public good. And if it's a public good, you want to think about how can you increase access to not only specific players, but maybe to society at large. Um, the theme is much, um, I mean, thinking about open data is much easier in the context of the public sector because um, people are paying taxes. And there is this idea that, okay, if we fund that data, um, citizens have a right to access to it. That's why in the area of public sector, um, um, in the public sector, um, the idea of open data is much more developed. But we are also thinking about um, uh, the concept of open data much more broadly in the context of the private sector and also in the context of individuals. And I would like to, to, to end my presentation with two examples. Uh, one is the idea that, okay, mobile um, companies are sitting on large um, data sets, and some of those companies are also um, have seen the, the potential of that data set um, for their commercial um, interests, and some of them are selling those data to, for instance, navigation um, um, system companies. And um, there's also, as Robert said, this idea that we could use the data for in the context of development. So the data philanthropist is, is also related to that. And the other idea that I would like to, 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 to um, highlight is the notion of, um, let's say, providing consumers access to their own data so that they can decide whether and to whom they want to share it. And this is an example that we heard in the UK uh, with the My Data, where consumers are granted the possibility to, to go to the companies owning their data and um, give, having the possibility to share the data with them so that they can share it with other companies as well as with society at large. So these are the, the topics that we are really interested in. Um, and uh, I think I would like to end here uh, and uh, everything else can be discussed in, during the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian. That was that was terrific. Let me ask if if Karen is on the line. I'm. Um, I see from an email from him that he can hear us fine, but he. Are you there? Uh, the email says he can, we can't hear you, and I certainly cannot hear him right now. 
Karen? All right, we'll try again. At least we're, I think we're getting closer. Alex, can you fill in for Karen for a moment? <laughs> Yeah, I can fill in, although I don't think we have the same perspective on the issue, so. <laughs> um, just a quick note about introducing Privacy International for those who, who don't know the organization, so you can understand the context uh, and, and what our mission is. Um, so Privacy International was the first organization to specifically work uh, only and specifically on, on the right to privacy. Um, and so through different actors and on different thematics, uh, we're trying to push for national, regional, and international frameworks to respect and promote the right to privacy and data protection. Uh, so that's what we do in, in a nutshell. Um, so what we wanted to raise is some of the concerns uh, about the increased use uh, of technology uh, and the development and humanitarian sector uh, with well-intended um, you know, objectives of helping people and for social good purposes. Uh, we don't discredit the advantages that have emerged from using these technologies, uh, especially in difficult environments, um, and conflict, post-conflict, um, and post-natural disaster context. Um, they've been very useful um, in overcoming the practical challenges of reaching out to people and providing people access to, to aid, healthcare, uh, and food. Um, but within, within that, we want to raise uh, four concerns uh, about the use of technology, and particularly mobile technology in, in these um, different programs. Uh, one is related to the legislative frameworks. Um, which in most countries where these technologies and these programs are being run, there is no legislative framework to protect data protection uh, of data owners. Um, there is often a right to privacy included at the constitutional level, uh, but there's no enforceability uh, of this right uh, for privacy. Um, and, and this can lead to, to serious human rights uh, violations, not only to the right to privacy, uh, but also in certain contexts, the violation of the right to freedom of expression, freedom of movement, if, these, if people are able to be re-identified um, and arrested in cases of human rights defenders or journalists. Uh, so these are all cases to take into account uh, because through this use of technology, you have an amassment of, of huge data that can be aggregated um, and used for unintended purposes such as re-identification. And this is within a legal void. So that's one of the concerns we have. Um, another one is linked to the multiple actors uh, that are involved in the deployment of these programs. Um, so you have often the host, like the government itself, um, that's involved. Uh, but you still also have um, the private sector um, who provides access to these services, such as um, telecom companies or um, internet providers. Um, and in the context, especially of development, um, the sector, you also have the donor community who can play a role, um, and also international NGOs who are the ones maybe pushing for the, you know, these programs through programs like e-transfers or um, cash learning uh, partnership programs. Um, and there is no, again, it's linked to the lack of framework to understand issues linked to uh, who is responsible for the data collected uh, in terms of ownership, but also accountability in case of violations. Um, so, you know, this raises quite a few issues about the individual uh, itself, like, in terms of the information they receive uh, when they're part of these programs, because I think in certain circumstances, people directly look at the social good and having access to healthcare, food, uh, and other basic essential services uh, without looking at the impact it can have on the longer term uh, on, their, on their privacy and what is being done with their data. Um, another element, and it's linked to the context uh, in which these programs are, are being deployed is in a way, the vulnerability of the beneficiaries, and it's linked to what I was saying now, um, are people informed uh, in these programs that the data is collected, that there's a possibility that it can be shared, but also the danger uh, of this mass collection of their data in a centralized database. Um, there are issues concerning the security uh, and answering of the data collected. Um, so those are all concerns we wanted to raise. 
one last one is linked specifically to, to the mobile system, and it was brought forward by, the, by Robert as a positive uh, side of using mobile technology as being able to identify trends, um, movements of people for social good purposes. But another, you know, a dual effect of that is being able to monitor people's movement, and that's linked to the surveillance, knowing where people are um, and monitoring their movements every step of the way, because mobile devices have to be in constant connections with cell sites. Um, and again, in certain circumstances, that can have really tragic effects on, on people's human rights. Um, so that's definitely something to take into account as we develop this forward. Um, data has definitely been seen as a new conflict resource, um, as a one-size-fits-all approach um, to, to solve you know, global poverty, um, poor development, um, poor access to, to social services. Uh, but there's definitely a need to, to take into account the impact on privacy, um, which can really have tragic um, consequ impacts uh, in the short term, but also in the long term. Um. Thank you very much, Alex. Let's try one more time to see if uh, Katarin is uh, back on the line. Hi, right, could you hear me? Hey. Yes, we can. We're relieved. Go ahead, okay. Karen. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Karan Pondure. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer of Algeta Digital. Uh, Aziata is a regional mobile telco. We have operations throughout Southeast and South Asia. Um, I'm responsible for all digital products, uh, including the uh, data as well as the uh, mobile advertising and digital advertising businesses. So I've got a, a fair interest in these issues uh, from a professional perspective. Um, but you know, apart from, from just that, uh, I've also got a personal interest um, not many of you uh, would remember a few years ago in Israel, there was uh, a case of a few terrorists being caught uh, because uh, the intelligence agencies were doing a, a semantic analysis on, on email threads and um, through a variety of techniques to be able to uncover a plot to uh, bomb a particular bus on a particular time. And, uh, and this is of interest to me because Later on, when, when the evidence came out in court, um, it turned out that I was scheduled to be at that particular place and at that particular time. And so if someone didn't have the uh, capability to analyze the data and uh, not address those privacy issues, I probably uh, wouldn't be here to, to share my thoughts with you today. Uh, so I, I do have a particular interest in, in, in the role of privacy, and I have a particular view of the role of privacy in big data uh, from a very personal experience. Um, coming back to, to uh, our, our perspective from, from a mobile operator, I think uh, Robert made a good case point about the fact that mobile operators have a lot of information um, and also the context of that information that is highly unique in the world. And, um, and to be fair, most of us are struggling very much with this issue. And um, the rise of internet players, uh, OTTs like Facebook and Google are really pushing those issues, um, which are very new to us. And so conferences such as these really enable us not to say that we have very uh, fixed viewpoints, but uh, enable us to modulate and understand how, how we need to approach this. I think there are three uh, major issues that I'd like to put forward, not as, as an expert, but really as, as a way to, to uh, try and stimulate debate um, around protection and security of data, obviously, um, but as well as the assignation of rights on data. Um, I think we've heard a lot about uh, the right to of privacy, um, and, and that, that is the important perspective. However, data, the data context does not exist on an individual basis. Um, a lot of issues with regard to who owns the data when uh, the result of information is really something that is shared. Um, the, the fact that I do something and someone else does something uh, provides a new data point, and which 
individual rights of that new data point. So part of the issue of, of right designation is really the issue of shared rights uh, and, and how do you address uh, something that is shared with not only one other person but maybe millions of others. Do I have stake in that information? And the third issue that I hope to be able to discuss is, is obviously one of enforcement. Uh, the second, I guess, principle I'd like to, to learn about is the fact that there are many different perspectives we can have to pick data privacy. Uh, one, obviously, from an individual perspective, but as uh, how do we manage uh, the individual shareholder uh, perspective? as well as government and organizations. I think we will all agree that all of us have fundamentally different viewpoints about the same topic. So I think that as a way of opening that square well end. Well, thank you very much. That was uh, very helpful. And the fact that you can communicate with us is almost remarkable. Uh, Rohan, um, we've heard about development. We've heard about uh, the economic uses of data. Rowan, you're an expert on all of these things. Enlighten us. Uh, thank you. Um, I uh, work with an organization called uh, LearnAsia, which is a, a regional think tank working across a number of uh, developing Asian countries. Uh, and uh, we actually were working on uh, big data before the term became popular. Uh, in the sense that we were taking epidemiological in, uh, symptomatic information uh, using mobile phones, putting them in to a database and running software from Carnegie Mellon on the uh, data to uh, see, uh, identify the patterns. Now this is uh, biomedical research, of course, uh, and we went through all the uh, privacy clearances, ethics clearances, and so on. Uh, the issue with this kind of big data is that it's very costly to produce. And as soon as the project funding ends, the data production also ends. Um, so I uh, was uh, looking at a, sub, uh, a subset of big data, which uh, was originally called uh, transaction-generated information by uh, Tom McManus in a piece that he wrote in 1991. And in the work that I did subsequently while I was teaching in the US, uh, I used the term TGI, uh, the term that Tom came up with. Uh, but in actual fact, it is better described as a subset of big data called transaction generated data. Uh, because this doesn't actually cost any additional resources to, to produce. It is produced as a byproduct of some other activity. So that is where we come to the, to the mobile data uh, sets that people have been talking about, and which is, of course, uh, attracting a great deal of interest. Uh, now, when we, as a uh, organization that seeks to do research that is pro-market and pro-poor, we are interested in big data that will have the greatest coverage of poor people. So, for example, if we are looking at bank information or supermarket information, uh, which is available in computer-readable form, we would be looking at very small subsets of rich people in the countries that we work in. In actual fact, there is only one data set that has comprehensive coverage of everybody, and that is mobile data. I would even argue that fixed uh, telephone data, which uh, some people have used for research, for example, in the UK, uh, will not do the trick in our countries since a minuscule minority uses fixed phones. Now, when it comes to this data, we actually have uh, obtained um, uh, these data sets from multiple operators. So we are not talking about this subject in the abstract. We are getting our hands dirty, uh, working on the legal niceties of getting access to the data, of uh, storing it. Just for example, uh, recently I was on an aircraft with uh, uh, two five terabit uh, hard disks in my suitcase. And I didn't even know what a terabit was until a few years ago. Uh, and I'm hauling around 10 terabit, terabits of memory because that's the kind of volumes that are coming in. Uh, 
uh, one of the kinds of questions that uh, mobile data allows us to address. Uh, quite a number of uh, development agencies and development thinkers are beginning to see uh, cities as the engines of growth in the 21st century. And there's a great interest in unclogging our cities. I think if you've been to any of our cities, Bangkok, uh, Jakarta, etc., you will understand that we are almost uh, immobile uh, by now. Uh, so we need to unclog our cities so that they can be the engines of growth. So there's a lot of interest that we wanted to focus on the size of cities, the, the transportation patterns, uh, perhaps even, uh, for example, the divides between different parts of cities. Do the rich parts and the poor parts actually communicate and so on. Now, for this purpose, we, uh, when we negotiated access to the data, we asked for historical and anonymized data, which I think I want to emphasize because I think Robert mentioned real time and I do not want at this stage of the game to touch real time data with a barge pole uh, because there are many serious implications that flow from real time data because uh, too many government people have uh, watched a minority report and uh, they have a certain interest in predicting the future. So my preference is of course to work with historical and anonymized data. Uh, and from the get-go, that's all we are working with. What is, I think, unique about our work compared to a lot of the big data research that is coming out is that we are not dealing with a single phone company's data. We are dealing with multiple phone company data. And to conclude, I would say that a lot of things that we talk about in the abstract, uh, once you get into the data, you find that that is not necessarily the case. So, for example, I assumed that we would have uh, the mobility data from the base stations as a, a SIM uh, moves from place to place, uh, that we would be able to get all that data. Quite a number of these companies, I would say the majority that we talk to, uh, actually flush this data. They don't bring it in. Uh, the different companies do not collect the same information. They have, because uh, you must remember, storage costs money. Uh, and uh, these people are scrambling around uh, to, to store the information, to have the data analysts to work on them, and so on. So they are, in, as I think you, you sort of got from Karan's uh, comments, uh, they are not also, uh, they are also in terra incognita. They are not exactly sure what they are doing, uh, and they want to do the right thing, I believe. Uh, they want to do what is good for the companies, uh, and they are doing some work that is, for example, helping them to identify the customers who are about to leave, and so on and so forth. The last point I want to make is that, you see, you cannot come at this problem with um, old mindsets and Western uh, frames. So, for example, in the West, it is relatively easy to think about a mobile connection or a number as being associated with a particular human being. Uh, in our countries, we, it is customary for people sometimes to go around with five SIMs. Uh, it is known that some people have 70, 80 SIMs illegally registered in their names by the people who sell SIMs. Uh, I can tell you how these things happen if you want during discussion time. So there is no relationship between a SIM and an actual human being uh, for the most part. And most of our people, 99%, 95% are on prepaid cards, not on postpaid. The whole idea of the classic inform and consent framework being applied to big data I think is quite problematic and as somebody who I think was present at the founding of uh, Privacy International and who has written quite a bit on the subject, I think this is an area where we have to be careful not to bring old thinking into, into a qualitatively different problem area. Thank you. Dr. Roth, thank you so much, Rohan. Uh, before turning to Pat in a moment, uh, two things. Uh, one is to remind you all that after Pat uh, finishes his opening remarks, we'll be going to all of you, and I'm uh, both by all of you, I mean those who are online as well as those of you in the room. And second, uh, on behalf, I think, of everyone here, I'd like to thank the GSMA for carrying the laboring oar of organizing uh, today's extraordinarily interesting uh, panel. Pat?
Um, thank you for your patience in uh, waiting to get the technical uh, issues sorted out. My name is Pat Walsh. Um, I work for the GSMA. The GSMA is a global trade body that represents 800 mobile phone operators around the world. Um, I'm an ex-chief privacy officer with mobile operators, and I also run teams of people that did government interception and disclosure, so I understand all sides of the base. I think a couple of things that have been said uh, today for me um, is that we talk about big data and it's abstract. Actually, uh, you know, to use Robert's term, it's an ocean. Uh, well, it's rivulets of little bits of data. Little bits of data, uh, for me, uh, that, that uh, reveal uh, very private aspects of people's behavior. Um, it's increasingly rich and contextualized. What do I mean? When I mean, and I hold up this thing, and increasingly in, in, in parts of the world that Rohan was referring to, people are moving to feature and smartphones as well in different environments. And, and location might be not just where I am, it may also be uh, where I'm not usually, which says something about me. It's about the direction of travel. It's increasingly about the uh, people and the things that I'm also connected to. Um, and when we talk about mobile data, I don't think we're quite clear. Um, mobile data can be many things. It can be the data on this. I have relationships with the operating system. They collect data about me. The device manufacturer collects data about me. The mobile operator collects data about me. The app that I'm using collects data about me. That shares data with third parties for advertising. So it's quite complex. In the developing environment, and I think what Rohan is talking about, is the use of call data records, which is produced uh, and generated by mobile phone networks. And that is extremely rich, and that is the only single view that you will get of location movements in a country, to be honest. And that's quite, why it's unique, and that's why it's powerful. I'm very passionate about this, because I believe that mobile technology has demonstrated to date the ability to transform uh, people's lives to empower people and I think now we have data it, 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 we have the, we've, we've come to a situation where data has the same ability to empower and transform empower individuals to be aware to manage their health uh, to transform societies who are suffering from uh, air pollution etc um, but I think we've got some real challenges and um, Alex referred to some of those, which is that whilst it's a globally connect connected world, um, you know, we have a patchwork of geographically bound laws that try to deal with privacy, where data flows between multiple parties in real time simultaneously. Um, I think we also have the issue, when we talk about mobile data, of course, that mobile operators are regulated in ways that other entities are not. So where an internet-based company may collect your location data, for example, um, they wouldn't be regulated in the same way. And some of that regulation that exists today has created some unique uh, privacy protections, I think. Uh, I mean, as, as an organization, many of our members uh, don't operate in countries where there are formal data protection and privacy legal frameworks, and that's why we've established mobile privacy principles, for example, to help our members establish a baseline. We have app guidelines to help them design apps with privacy in mind. But when it comes to um, big data, I think, you know, Rohan talked about it. How many of you remember Haiti and the earthquake in Haiti? I mean, mobile data helped to understand where people had moved to. It was crucial in disaster response situations. When we knew where people had moved to, the agencies were able to target and drop food and shelter, etc. Um, I think also um, it helps to understand the spread of disease in some countries too. It's been very powerful. But for me, I think the urban planning environment, the need to reduce air pollution, is probably the most striking because that raises a very real question about the rights of society and the rights of individuals and how to achieve a balance in a way that respects privacy and protects privacy. So what do I mean by that? You know, Rohan alluded to Bangkok. I was in Malaysia recently. I noticed China issued an air pollution warning yesterday because it's got so serious in Beijing. And how many of you commute into cities and drive into cities? And at the end of the day, you leave the city, right? You pollute, you leave. You leave the problem behind. Well, actually, mobile data can help understand and manage more intelligently those flows of traffic. It can help reduce air pollution and noise pollution for the communities and the individuals that live in those communities. And if I, I, I went to a smart city event in Brussels recently and a member of the European Commission said that it costs Europe combined together 
1 billion euro a month to deal with the external costs of air pollution because 70% of those problems are respiratory problems. So big data, mobile derived big data can help reduce some of these external costs. It can help transform and enhance people's lives. So let's not focus obsessively, as I seem to hear constantly, about the fact that somebody knows what DVD and what video I've watched online. Let's focus on some of these broader, big societal uh, issues. And let's ask the question, are people, is society entitled to have data used in wise and responsible ways to address some of the most pressing problems that some of these scientists face. I think they do. Is it a human right to have access to clean water? Many people at this conference would say yes. Is it a human right to have access to clean air? Many at this conference would say yes. Is it a right to have access to health care? Absolutely. Well, data can help these. And I think we have to find a different way to do this. So I'm going to wrap up quickly. So what do I think? We talked about anonymization. Actually, I think we need to understand that this, we need to take a risk-based approach. In this agile environment, I don't think any of the previous year's impact assessments methodology that I've seen can understand these risks and mitigate them in an appropriate way. Anonymization. So what's the latency between the data being in a non-anonymized form and an anonymized form? Because it's that latency period that creates risks. And will anonymizing data reduce other risks associated with a huge database of people? I don't think it will. We need to be careful of that because it creates security risks. So, you know, in many countries that Rohan was referring to, people live in distinct cultural and ethnic groups. So movement data can help you understand where they move to, but of course, in the wrong hands, that might be an issue. And we have to understand, so how do we create the right algorithms, the right encryption, the right security processes? So there's a technology challenge, because at the moment, there are different approaches to this. Um, I think also then we need to understand, therefore, that it's not just about PII. In this big data space, I don't see any common taxonomy. I mean, every person in this room probably has a different view of, of that. I think that um, a code of conduct is also uh, necessary, I think, partly because uh, laws don't exist in many of these regions, um, and therefore something has to be done, and that's for the stakeholders to come together, um, I think. Um, that's it from me. Sorry. Well, I hope that's not it for you. I hope <laughs> we're going to have a very lively conversation. You've been wonderfully provocative. All right, let me turn to, uh, to the rest of everyone uh, and ask if there are any questions or statements. I see a question or a statement right here. Hi, John Selby from Macquarie University in Australia. A month ago, I was in rural Tanzania and I was uh, staying in a Maasai village and the villagers there live on an average of about $1 per day. So you're talking the poorest of the poor. Mud huts, no running water, aid projects coming in to bring water, etc. One mobile phone shared by the entire village. And one person, a separate person in the village has a, uh, a generator to charge that mobile phone because none of them can afford that. There's no electricity there, etc. So you're making a big deal about the policy assumptions that can be made from mobile phone data in helping the poor. In my experience there, um, it wouldn't necessarily be that useful for the poorest of the poor because they don't have the mobile phones to be used to get that data, to do that analysis. So it will help down to some level of the poor, but the poorest of the poor will still be missing in that data. So that was just a, a comment I was making and whether that was being taken into account. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, is there anybody who is either Robert, Karen, or Christian like to comment? Because I can't see you to see if you'd like to, usually people nod at me when they want to comment. Let me go there first and then I have a bunch of people uh, nodding this, here. This is, uh, this is Robert. I just, if I might very briefly, um, fully agree. Uh, there are significant challenges around representativeness um, of this data, and I would certainly say, you know, if you are, um, if you're talking about a, a poor community where there are no mobile phones and no electricity, um, then you are producing big data, and big, and you are not then you're not producing big data, and you're not represented in big data, and therefore there's going to be bias. Um, you certainly wouldn't want decisions made. In, supposedly in your interest based on an analysis of which you are not part. Um, you know, our, our view is that this is a brand new field, right? 
when people lose their jobs, when they get sick, um, when they begin to struggle economically, we don't know what the signatures of, of these changes in well-being are in the data yet. It's going to take us several years to develop the, the partnerships, the um, privacy protection methodologies, uh, the technologies, and the, and the analytical understanding of what to look for in the data. And by that time, we're expecting private sector to have found ways to close the digital divide further um, so that more and more people have phones. We're trying to think about how we can be operating from a policy perspective in five years. I would note that big data is also creating a new digital divide because data centers, even if everything's free and open source, have a huge air conditioning bill. And this kind of analysis is something that is putting a, a very different kinds of, pow of power in the hands of a very small number of elite today. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, Alex? No, I, I mean, we completely agree, and it's something I brought up yesterday in the panel on big data development and privacy. Um, big data, because of the nature and the way it works, is discriminatory and exclusionary. Um, it excludes people that don't use the Internet, that don't use Facebook, that don't shop online. You know, all of these things that interconnect, um, where the data is collected from different sources, don't include the poorest of the poor. Um, and that's why we started working on this aspect of development programs and humanitarian aid, um, because if the purpose is to help, you know, let's say the poorest of the poor and those who really need the help, if they're not included in the decision-making processes and the data used to develop these policies, then they will be inefficient and inadequate and they won't solve the, the roots of the problem. Uh, I mean, just to give a quick example, in, in Africa, less than 10% of the population is connected to the internet. Um, and that's where a lot of the programs are, are being deployed. So that's definitely a concern. Ron? Um, one is must always be careful about drawing conclusions from one observation. Um, we do surveys. Uh, we have been doing large sample surveys, uh, 10,000 sample, 12 languages across uh, uh, the bottom of the pyramid in Asia. So, for example, in Bangladesh, when we ask uh, whether people have used a telephone in the last uh, uh, three months, we are getting something like 99% have used. Uh, not that they own, but they have used. Uh, I think I should be able to, the data for Tanzania is done by some of our colleagues at Research ICT Africa, and it should be available. Uh, the issue, however, I think there are some interesting issues, which is I think anybody who does research knows that nobody has got perfect data. You're talking about what is the best available data, and best available is not perfect, never is. Uh, the other issue, of course, the more interesting question is that of collective privacy. Uh, I have some interesting stories that I can tell about collective privacy. That is, you can never tell uh, what that individual person in that village is doing because that SIM is being used by everybody. But maybe it is saying something about that village as against another village. And I think a lot of people who theorize privacy have no idea about collective privacy rights, which is something that intrigues me. And one of these days, when I get a bit of time, I'll work on it. Thank you, Rowan. No, I think you raise an exceptionally you know, valid point, and, and our association is busy working around the world, um, not just in Africa, to try and build out uh, more um, networks, more capacity. And I think that really is important that you do and may have sexual society excluded by a lack of access to technology, where more and more um, our relationships with governments and, and, and corporations are determined by um, by our access to technology. Uh, I just wanted to say one other thing in this, that, that the only thing that I see that's consistent across this space, uh, because people are enmeshed in different relationships, is a lack of consistency in approach to privacy. Um, and I think you know individuals deserve um, for stakeholders to come together to find some common approach. Thank you very much. We're going to take a couple of questions together, because uh, I know there's a lot of audience uh, who would like to participate, and then we'll seek responses. Mike, you had one? Uh, real quick, um, Alexandrine, 
Mike Nelson with Microsoft, and also I teach Internet Studies at Georgetown. Uh, Alexandrine, you, you're sort of outnumbered here. Uh, these people are passionate about big data, and you're passionate about privacy. Um, so I wanted to give you a little chance to, to, to give us a few more examples, because we heard examples of cell phone data fighting epidem epidemics, fighting uh, the, the helping clean up after the Haitian earthquake. Uh, I'd like to hear an example or two where cell phone data clearly was linked to some terrible outcome, either for an individual or for a group of people. Um, that, that often can motivate good policy. Uh, even a bad example can motivate good policy. And I'd be particularly interested if you think we need to do what Patrick said, is rethink our uh, the way we classify different types of data. He said that the old PII model may not work when some of this data isn't thought of as PII data, but could be used to uh, extract very personal um, uh, information. Okay, thank you, Mike. And while we give Alex more time to think of the perfect couple of examples, we'll go keep going. Um, 30 years in a data protection uh, authority in Europe, 30 years in a data protection uh, uh, authority in Europe. Uh, first, I would say that it's true that for any uh, study that is needed and the public interest, you don't even, you don't always have the data. Even in Japan, uh, with the, the, the terrible problem they had, some data were not existing and everybody had been collecting the data that they need, what was the level at one meter of the sea. Nobody had that. Okay, so as always, you need the right data for the right problem. Now, I completely agree that there might be public interest to derogate to the secrecy of communication, which is, which is uh, uh, accepted all over the world. Huh? Secrecy of correspondence. It means who is calling who. Which, okay. And even if a SIM is, is used by several persons, in Europe we say you have to, to uh, think about the SIM calls as they were personal data. As they were. And the fact, and to anonymize, let me, give me the example, and I will tell you where it is anonymized and why it is not. It's a case-by-case case question. Now, for derogation, and we agree that there might be derogation in the name of the public order. Who decides that for management of uh, traffic data on a highway, you, you can use uh, mobile traces? Huh? I agree. Who decides? How long do you keep the data? Uh, who has access to the data and so forth? I am sure that for public interest, first we have to know who decides, uh, not hidden, who decides in a democratic way, uh, the cases. And secondly, how the, the data processing is operated. And, and this is, must be public. Thank you. Thank you very how? much. No, okay, next. Uh, uh, Thank you. I think one of the very important things if you're trying to get the right balance between uh, use of uh, big data and privacy is to frame the question you ask people correctly. If we take the example you've just given of collecting mobile data, if you frame the question, are you happy for your mobile data to be collected as you go along in your car for your geolocation, and you say, we want to do it because um, we're going to try and reduce air pollution, or we want to do it because um, we're going to reroute you round the fastest route, uh, people will all say yes. But if you say we're doing it because we want to make sure no one is speeding, then they will all say no. And so, uh, I mean, that's maybe a rather trivial example, but um, it's incredibly important to frame uh, the questions for people to get the balance you're seeking um, in, in an appropriate fashion. Thank you. Now, I know we've got a number of others, so let's take that as one block. And we're going to go to Christian first, because I understand he's trying to, uh, to come in if he's still online. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, I would like actually to to to, um, to respond to the last point because I think it's it, it it's related to another important point that I wanted to make, which is um, the democratization of big data. A lot of the examples that we have heard so far are basically still about citizens or individuals um, being, if you want, a subject of big data, and then you have. A, a small group of users like researchers or big companies or government using the data for um, well, um, I mean, well understandable reasons like uh, preventing natural disasters or dealing with natural disasters. I think this is one aspect of the big data, but we shouldn't restrict ourselves to those examples because I believe that, and now I, I link to what the gentleman just said, um, I think we need to, to let people really actively participate in the big data discussion or exchange. So it's not only about, yes, um, asking people, explaining to people what do we want to do with the data, because yes, many people would agree that if you use the data to prevent um, diseases, outbreaks, and, and so on, or to reduce um, pollution, people, most people would agree that, okay, I, I, I'm okay with sharing my data. I think this is one aspect, and we don't do it very, very well so far. The other aspect is really also letting people themselves use the data. Now, obviously, not everyone has the skills to use the data and to do big data analytics. Although, I would like to argue that nowadays we have tools in place that make it easier for even non-data scientists to use the data. And so far, we should also look at that aspect, which we don't do. So, I would like to end here with that. Thank you very much. Alex? Um, I do have a couple examples, actually, that are part of my presentation, so it's great. Um, the first one I'll mention is the Data for Development initiative uh, from Orange um, Telecom Service in Côte d'Ivoire. Um, from, from the mobile phone traffic data, um, they're able to yeah, aggregate the data and make conclusions about social divisions and segregation based on ethnicity, language, religion, and political persuasion. Uh, sorry, yeah, persuasion, political stance, which in the context of Côte d'Ivoire and the recent elections can have really tragic impact on political activists and human rights defenders. Um, the other one I wanted to mention was um, in the, in the aftermath of the anti-government food process, uh, protest in 2008 in Egypt, the authorities um, used call and text message data um, to identify protesters and convict them. Um, so these are two examples I want to, and the initiative at the beginning was a, is a good initiative, but then it was used for, you know, for a wrong purpose. Uh, in terms of, of the personal Data. I don't know if I understood the question correctly. Well, I was following up on what Pat said. He, he said that the old idea of we have PII and then we have other data, mm -hmm. that model may not no longer apply, that we, maybe we need some finer grained system or we need some other way of differentiating. Maybe it's not a, a one-dimensional thing anymore. Maybe there's several different things. We so, have. so there are new data categories, Alex, and new concepts which give rise to, which have privacy implications. Uh, and focusing just on the fact that, you know, it's Pat Walsh doesn't really do it. Uh, there are other contexts and other data categories that could have privacy and security risks for me. And it's the context that we should be looking at more rather than just a set of data. Um, yeah, I mean, then just on, on that note, um, I mean, it's key examples. For example, we're working with a partner in Kenya, working with HIV AIDS patients. Um, and Kenya's putting in place a lot of e-health services so that HIV patients get reminded about their appointments and getting their medication, and they're using mobile technology for that. But it means that somewhere down the line, this information can be accessed by the government, but also maybe religious groups, and there's a, a high stigma, unfortunately, still for HIV patients. Uh, so maybe that's one of the examples on that, and uh, the dangers of, you know, the, the assumptions get, that can be made uh, and in certain contexts, and not only in developing countries, uh, even in, in the West, that can, that can have an impact. Okay. 
Uh, well, I'd like to address the two points uh, by Mara George and sorry, uh, the lady in the corner, because th they're really there are some fundamental issues. Uh, and one is you talk about European law and uh, mobile call, uh, so traffic data and location data, which is regulated by the Privacy Directive in Europe. Uh, but for me, that doesn't do it because we need to be looking at the context. Because, for example, the traffic data and location data that's generated by mobile or fixed operators in Europe is regulated by the Privacy Directive, but the equivalent data that's processed by internet players, VoIP and, and WhatsApp messaging, for example, is not regulated. So, so if we don't see the privacy harms emerging in that other space, to what degree has regulation in this other space created good privacy protections? We need to take a different approach and look at what is, what are the risks that we're trying to address now? Because the risks are not the same when those laws were introduced. Uh, so that's a fundamental question, I think, whether well, or not. Uh, and then we have um, in the corner, that's a really good point about the way people feel and how you put the question to them. Uh, but another question is, you know, is about choice and limits to choice. And that same regulation says that those that are subject to it must erase or anonymize the data on termination of a communication. So if you're complying with the law and you have anonymous data sets, is there a problem using that data set to understand the movement of traffics? Pat, as always, is provocative. <coughs> All right, we're going now. We'll do, another, we'll, we'll do another a couple of questions together because we're starting to run out of time. Hi, thank you. Lynette Taylor, Oxford Internet Institute. Um, this is a really good and substantial discussion. Um, thank you all. <clears throat> I wanted to ask a question about the configurations of research that are optimal for this kind of work in developing countries. Because the, the matter that Pat Walsh brought up, the problems of clean air, clean water, access to health care, these are excellent examples of things which don't, which don't have an engineering solution where you need a political will and you need human rights and you need country level understanding, capacity, enforcement. So how do we not treat big data as the solution, but as a symptom of the problem and as a guide to how to address it? Who else should get involved along the way? And how do we stop it being just the data scientists who receive the data and the information? And my other question also goes back to GSMA. Um, in your privacy guidelines, you equate anonymization with deletion of data. I think this is problematic because there's no advance in anonymization which hasn't been followed by an advance in the ability to hack um, and to re-identify people. So what should, how should we conceptualize anonymization in terms of the type of data uses that we're thinking about here and particularly with regard to group privacy, collective privacy as Rohan just mentioned, which I think is hugely important. Thank you. Excellent. Over here. Thank you. John LaPreeze from Northwestern University. We're starting to hear a lot of conversation, both from, I think, Christian and Robert, as well as the, the previous uh, commenter, about uh, data scientists, which really, when you come down to it, we're talking about statisticians. And I'm just wondering, we're, we're in a panel here about big data, and if I could ask the, the, the room for a show of hands, how many people in this room actually have a working knowledge of statistics? that you actually know what a p-value is, if that makes any sense to you. That's for the discussion of big data, that's, that's in some part the essential for your understanding of the complexity of, of, of the problems involved. And I mean, at some level, you know, that's one of the capacities that you have to build among policymakers for uh, any discussion of big data, you know, both the, the strengths and weaknesses and what it can do and what it can't do. Um, because if you don't know the underlying st the rules of statistics and how statistics work, you really, you really don't know what you're talking about in some sense. You don't know the limits. So I just want to throw that out at the, at the panel about uh, the, the, the need for uh, statistical literacy. Thank you. Joe, I know you always know what you're talking about, so why don't you give a question? Well, you know, I think when we've been talking about big data in, in most of the cases that we've been talking about, we've been talking about the idea of the more data you throw a question into, the better your answer may become, which is whether that's true or not is a, is a significant question. But we really haven't been talking about big data in terms of the potential for correlation uh, because the whole concept is uh, one of the best examples is a hospital in Canada with that specializes in premature birth. They started, instead of just real-time tracking of the information for the nurse, they started to capture the information. And they came up with a finding that was counterintuitive. 
24 hours before the baby spikes a fever, it turns out all of the baby's levels stabilize, which one would think would mean the baby was doing better. They don't actually know why the levels stabilized, but they figured out that that's an indication that in 24 hours the baby will spike a fever that could be fatal. And what they did was they started treating the baby at the time the fever, at the time the level stabilized, not at the time the fever spiked, they decreased infant mortality, limited the amount of time the baby was in jeopardy, and improved patient outcomes. That's all based on a correlation, not on causation, because they still don't know why it happens. They guess, but they don't know. And so part of the issue that comes in as a challenge to privacy is the fact that privacy, which is consent-based, requires a specific permission for a use of information. But the problem is if you're looking at correlations of data, you can't ask for a specific permission. And then this goes to the point Marie-Georges made about the public interest. Because one of the things, the work that the OECD is doing at the moment between uh, the Working Party on Information Security and Privacy as well as the Healthcare Working Group, is they're trying to figure out if you have a previously collected data set that was authorized for use in one case, is there a potential use case you could develop in which you talk about the controls, you talk about the access limitations, you talk about the validity of the use, but where you might be able to use that information for a purpose that was not identified at the time of the collection of the information. And so it reminds me, the OECD had a panel on big data, and one of the closing comments was made by one of the French delegates who was a, a, a researcher and entrepreneur, uh, and he reminded everyone that they had to be responsible for their use of big data, but they equally had to be responsible for their failure to use big data. So both sides of that equation are important, and we have to remember that we need to control and address the risk, but we, don't, we shouldn't also forego the opportunity um, because those are, are both important concepts. Thank you. There was a question over here. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, my question to the panel really relates to the question of trust because um, I've heard some terrific uses of big data and I certainly think um, it, it, it's a very valuable thing, but um, we're at a point where over you know, the last couple of months uh, a lot of our trust has been very severely eroded. This relates to um, surveillance revelations and it also relates to the collection of um, my, you know, use of my personal data for marketing purposes without my permission by large corporations. So my actions over the last few months is I've moved my servers out of the United States, I've stopped using Google+, Plus. I've stopped using Gmail, I turn off my browser, I'm looking for an alternative to Chrome. If I could find an alternative for family um, where I keep up with them, I'd be out of Facebook. Um, I'm looking for the alternative to Android, um, I use ad blocking software and essentially, you know, I'm changing my whole pattern of behavior on the internet as much as I can because I think these revelations are quite serious. So how, what measures do you suggest would be good ones to restore trust? Thank you. All right, we've now had a series of interesting statements and questions. Uh, we'll go for one more, but we're running out of time and I know we need to go to the phones as they like to say. Uh, yes, ma'am. Keith Booth, New Zealand. Is there big data that governments or others hold that should be released for social gain? We've been focusing on the personal data and the obviously critical privacy um, implications, but is there big data that isn't out there, that pub is public data but not used that should be? Very good. Let me ask uh, Robert or uh, Christian, who may still be on the line, we hope, uh, if they have any comments before we go to those here in the room. Uh, uh, Robert, Robert here. Um, I could just very, very briefly uh, note, I mean, you know, our interest in, in analysis is not uh, individuals because our interest is in policy action. Uh, as I've mentioned, I, you know, I think I, we, don't, we don't care whether someone lost his job and had to sell the family cow. We're interested in knowing that there was a 300% increase in attempts to sell livestock in a particular district of a country at a suspiciously unusual time of year. Right? So we're looking at aggregate analysis of information um, because we're looking at anything that would justify a policy response in the plight of an individual would not. So for that reason, 
We never received personally identifiable information from any of the partners who share data with us. We never received con you know, information that was presumed to be confidential at the time that it was shared. Um, and, and, you know, that's a good starting point. But, um, and, and, you know, uh, Pat was alluding to this, I mean, it's becoming pretty clear that all of the data that we produce by going about our daily lives and using digital services, we, you know, we produce it in unique ways because we use the services in unique ways, which means that anonymization is probably algorithmically impossible, um, particularly with, uh, you know, with individual records of behavior, even if you don't have, you know, phone numbers and uh, other information included. So uh, this notion of moving toward a risk-based approach um, I think makes sense. Um, it's not clear what that would look like. Um, but, you know, if you, if you ask people, would they be willing to share their data if you were dealing with PII um, and they were a public good or a personal benefit to them, they would probably in many cases be likely to do it. When we're talking about data that isn't even PII, um, but where there's some non-zero risk of re-identification and potential misuse, um, we need to be having a public discussion that recognizes that any, any reuse scenario where there is a public good is still going to be a kind of trade-off satisficing decision. Um, and we need to move toward having a, a public and a, and a policy uh, development framework that's educated about uh, making those kinds of trade-off decisions. We're not there yet. Um, um, I, I would like to add um, two points. I think one is the example that, that um, Patrick just highlighted shows that in many cases you don't really need um, um, personal identifiable data in order to, to gain the benefits. And it's true that we tend to focus a lot on, on, on the really, let's call it micro data aspect of, of big data, which is really targeted to individuals. Because yes, that's true. It's, um, that's probably the type of data set that the marketing or marketing companies are using because they want to have personalized uh, advertisements. But in many cases, when we are talking about the social benefits, one doesn't need to go at that micro level. I think it's perfectly um, useful to work at the macro level. This is one point. The other point is we also tend to think about big data as big personal data. And it's also true that many of the data sets out there that also can bring a lot of benefits are not personal. I'm talking about weather data. I'm talking about um, business activities data. I'm talking about uh, public sector activities data that can also bring a lot of benefits. Obviously, we tend to focus on the privacy as aspect because it's the most challenging part, but we shouldn't restrict the discussion about big data to those aspects. Thank you very much. Uh, looking here, Alice, do you have any comments? And I should note that these are all also in the form of closing comments because we're already at our closing time. Uh, just to re bounce back on some of the comments about consent is definitely something that is a problem because of the nature of big data. There is no way of finding out what's, what are the sources, what are the origin of the data, and identifying if, and that's linked to the person being unidentifiable, if you're using these sources that give data that can't be identified to a specific person, there's still an issue of consent. Um, the other one was the one just now about, again, identified, identifiable data for social good. Um, it's the mere fact of correlating all this data in one database, just the, mere, the, you know, the existence of this database in one form or another can impact privacy without, at that moment in time, challenging privacy. So it's just thinking about the short and the long term uh, of that. Thank you much. Rowan? Uh, I, I think in my comments I made, uh, I said that we cannot uh, and we should not impose uh, simplistic notions of inform and consent on this qualitatively new phenomenon of big data. Uh, because I could see, for example, that a mobile company needs your mobility data uh, in order to plan and manage its network. It needs your purchasing behavior, your credit behavior, etc., etc., in order to manage its financial aspects of your of its relations with its customers. So, if these concepts are 
imposed mechanically on the phone companies, what will happen is that they will be able to use it, they will be able to predict your behaviors, because that would be all covered by conventional uh, consent agreements. The only thing is that it will not be, we will not be able to use it for traffic management, uh, for uh, figuring out how to develop our cities or to remove the constraints that affect our development. Uh, that is all that will happen. Because the, the marketing aspects, the fine tuning, the, all that will happen inside the companies. Because that can be covered by generic, uh, generic informant consent rules. So I think this is like, uh, I think in the early days of the, of the motor car, there were some uh, regulators, some governments that asked people to walk in front of the motor car with a bell, I believe, uh, because that was their concept of how that particular new technology should be regulated. Uh, so I think we are seeing a bit of a repeat of that. And I think we need to be a little more imaginative than that. And I would also say to our colleague who talked about the knowledge of statistics, I think one of the things that I have understood in the big data field is that you cannot have one person doing all the work. It is done by teams. And we do have uh, statisticians, data people, all kinds of people in our teams. Uh, and uh, we don't do this without that knowledge. Thank you. Pat? Thank you. Well, I, I think for me, um, it is about risks and managing risks and uh, coming up with a framework to ensure uh, accountabilities are assigned and met across uh, this distributed ecosystem. I think we do need new PIA methodology for uh, identifying mitigating risks in what is an extremely agile uh, context. We don't have that. We need uh, technology solutions, and whether that is from a data scientist point of view, for example, and we have sat in room with some, <laughs> um, is, you know, how do we have privacy preserving and protective algorithms? We have people that want to come together to find these solutions, which is fantastic for me, because people just want, are pushing at the door. And um, I think, you know, codes of conduct. Um, and I think the other thing to take the point here uh, that was mentioned earlier is because, yes, there are risks that emerge from uh, data being stored, even in anonymized ways. So how do you regulate the investigatory powers of a state? How do you establish clear legal frameworks that regulate the investigation by law? Exactly. It's, it's set in law, it's transparent, it's justified, and it's proportionate. So how do you do that in the global context? That's another challenge. Well, that the time has left us, as these things often do when they're so interesting. I think it's actually this is a remarkably easy panel and session to summarize. It's confusing. <laughs> it's constantly changing. And it's incredibly important. With that, I think we should thank our extraordinary panelists, both here and remotely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done. <laughs>